story is set all the way back in 2015. When I was only three and my father was still a math student, he owned a calculus book. And every time I would try to go into his room and touch it, uh, he took me out of the room and gave me all my toys. It was kind of like Eve touching the forbidden fruit. But one day, my father was away from home, and he didn't take the book with him. I pounced on the opportunity, and before long, I clutched the book in my hands. It looked so beautiful. I opened it up to see a mystical forest, an ecosystem of symbols, variables, and equations all cooperating and living together in harmony. Now, of course, I'm going to be real here. I understood none of it. But I was still so fascinated by it that I tried to carry this book to the blackboard and inscribe or transcribe, rather, all these findings. But I found that the book was too heavy. And so I made a smart decision. Because I, as I just said, have a resolution for every day. I just ripped out some of the pages of the book and then pinned them to the wall. When my father came home that night, I just neatly tucked those pages right into position and hoped he wouldn't notice. However, he did. His first suspect for who tore out those pages was my elder brother, Rifa. But when I confessed it was me, and I sold him all of the beautiful writings that I had made on the chalkboard. Instead of getting mad at me for tearing up his book like <clears throat> brute force, he cried tears of joy. I was only three and a half at that time, about three and a half anyways. But I started learning calculus from that day, even though I only knew exponents. And by the time I turned five, I had almost fully mastered calculus, a subject that was, at the time, taught to people who were 10 or 11 years older than I. So I believe that this shows that learning and age, or rather knowledge and age, are not in the same equation. They don't coincide. Then, I believe that knowledge grows according to your learning curve. Now, everyone has a different learning curve, even though we all reach the same point eventually. So, however, the, our school system right now c caters to only a straight line. A, it's not quite a learning curve right now, it's a learning line, because what you learn is just set by your age. So that means every year you're learning something a little bit more advanced. But years sometimes is too long. And maybe sometimes years are too short. Sometimes students can learn faster than what the education system allows them to. And sometimes students with special needs can learn slower then the education system have a hard time catching up. But the school system puts uh, us through essentially a mold that pushes back those who learn faster and leaves behind those who learn slower. So, I believe that instead of sorting kids by their age, we should instead sort them by how they learn. If they learn fast or if they can pick up things quickly, then you can advance them to higher grades faster. If they take a little bit more time to learn things or if they have different kind of ways of learning, they need something more hands-on, then you can put them somewhere different. So, I believe that we need a school system that caters to th those who have different learning curves instead of just being a straight line. So now, that's the school system's fault. It follows a system similar to Piaget's theory, which suggests that
that ch uh, children develop their, their knowledge of the world around them in stages from 0 to 2, 2 to 7, 7 to 11, and 11 and beyond. But I believe we should use a system similar to Vygotsky's theory, which states that every child has a kind of a zone of what they can do and what they can do with a teacher, parent, or general, uh, generally a mentor's help. That's called the ZPD in Vygotsky's talk. So, the v ZPD grows at different rates for different people, and the rate at which it grows may vary over time, even for an individual. So, now, that's one part of the problem, our school system. But, the second part of the problem may just be the, our teachers. Now, our teachers need to not only be obviously good teachers, uh, be able to handle a bunch of children in one room, but also they should be able to be a good mentor, not always being mad at the students, but instead helping them learn and motivating them to continue even if the students have a major setback. So let me give you the example of Miss Rita Pearson, a late educator, who once gave a touching story about how she taught an uncooperative elementary school class. The example of late educator Miss Rita Pearson, who once touchingly taught an uncooperative elementary school class. But she was able to motivate them into focusing and doing better. One kid once uh, was given a spelling quiz in her class and miraculously, almost impressively actually, he got 18 out of 20 of the questions wrong. Wow, just wow, that's what I call achievement. But instead of putting 10% a frowny face or minus 18 or two out of 20, Miss Pearson put plus two with a smiley face. So the student came up to her and said, why the plus two? Why the smiley face? I got 18 questions wrong. And Miss Pearson said, yes, you did. But you got two right. So it ain't all bad. Won't you do better when we review? Yes, ma'am, the child said. Miss Pearson would also encourage them at any time they would form a line and go out into the hallway. Remember, they are elementary school kids. They do this kind of thing. And she would say, let's be quiet in the hallway because we are the best class. I'm the best teacher and you are the best student. We were all put together for a reason. So, we got to show the other classes how to do it. Let's be as quiet as we can in the hallway. I believe that we need our students' self-esteem to be boosted. We need our students to not be sad all the time. We need our students to actually be trying instead of just failing and not caring. Because let's say a student gets a bad grade and the teacher is harsh at them for it. Their self-esteem is lowered. They feel bad about themselves. So they st stop trying in that class or start trying less which causes their grade to lower, which causes their self-esteem to lower even more, and the cycle continues. It's a very harmful cycle that can not only break a student's grades, it can, uh, but it can also break a student's chance of getting a good education, and most importantly, it can break a student's mental health as a whole. Students are still people. So, the second problem I want to cover is teachers who can uh, think outside the box or at least open to ideas that are outside the box. Teachers that are open-minded, that don't uh, have a fixed mindset. Let's say you have a physics teacher named Mr. I Can't Imagine. Wow, I really can't imagine being named that. So Mr. Tamajin is teaching physics 
and one day when one of his students finds a mistake in the problem he's solving he says I've been doing this for a million years I've been doing this problem longer than you've been alive so you're saying that in the thousand times I've been doing it I've been doing it wrong this whole time no I'm not going to accept that and don't rudely speak up in class again or I'll lower your grade even more he lowered the student's grade in class that day for rudely speaking up. Wow, just wow. Then, the next day, he's teaching something different, and another student finds a more efficient way to uh, solve an equation. A student finds a more efficient equation to solve a certain type of problem. However, since the teacher has it taught that when the student uses his formula in the test on a test during a free response question uh, he's marked wrong because his answer was right but his work was wrong even though his work was still fully valid so he got points taken off and his grade lowered even though he learned something new that's the central message here so, even though Mr. Tamajin, because Mr. Tamajin doesn't know or he can't imagine anything outside his little box of thinking, he rejects all these students' ideas and their grades are lowered, and that fits right back into the last point about self-esteem. They try less, and even though they discovered something, their learning was inhibited by him decreasing their grades and him being unimaginative. Wow, Mr. I can't imagine. I really can't imagine being named that by my parents. Let's be real here. They weren't very imaginative with their names. I think this can best be summarized by Sir Ken Robinson's joke. He made this once during the TED Talk. So, um, there's this guy, he's teaching an elementary class, and he tells everyone to draw anything they can imagine. So this little girl at the back of the class who's usually slacking off is hyper-focused on her drawing. So the teacher can't imagine what she's drawing, can't imagine what she's drawing, and so he comes up to her and says, what are you drawing? And she says, God. And the teacher says, but we don't know what God looks like. Why are you talking to me like that? And the girl says, yeah, we don't know what God looks like. Not until I finish this drawing. So, uh, even though this is just a metaphor, and also even though some of you may not have laughed at that, I'm so sorry. It was such a letdown. It's still important because the teacher cannot imagine an image of God, but the student could. So, finally, I would like to highlight the need for a sort of math center, you know? A math center where educators, these kinds of educators that follow the rules that I just indicated, can actually teach our students and teach them in a hands-on way, and that can account and cater to every type of student. Now, I've already made a model curriculum, which has 20 chapters, each with, on average, some have seven, some have four, five subtopics. I really should have called them subchapters, but you know me, I like to vary things up. So, I'm going to make 20 websites for each of the 20 chapters. I've already made websites one and two, and the other 18 websites will take about three months in total to finish. We may make some tweaks here and there along the way, but it's almost finished. So, I also believe, you know that match center I mentioned earlier? I would like to credit Dr. Ben Anderson, chairman of the Da Vinci Institute in South Africa, for suggesting this idea to me and coming up with it. And before I go, I would also like to thank everyone else who's helped me on my endeavors 
and first of all, everyone who's attending this TT100 event. Thank you. And a special personal thank you to Dr. Mabunda, Mrs. Mabunda, Mr. Vusi, Dr. Marla, Dr. Klopper, Dr. Fonzel, um, Trisan, and uh, Mrs. Susie. Thank you, everyone, for being with me along the way. And especially Chova the Elephant. Thank you as well. Bye.